Hello everyone and welcome back for another AI news show where myself and Kevin Keeler is going to be digging into some of the latest AI news headlines. Welcome Kevin, how's it going? That's going well Rob and as I think I say every time there is no lack of new AI news to cover but I think for this time we have a specific theme in mind. We do indeed. This time we said we'd talk about AI assistance. Uh, we're seeing this a lot in the news lately. Uh, I suppose not to be confused with AI voice assistants. I suppose they're one and the same thing, but we're going to dig into that too. Um, but there's uh, probably the best place to start, Kevin, is, um, I mean, it, we are going to talk about some AI assistant related news, but um, let's just firstly define for our audience what AI assistants are. I know you've got a lot of experience talking about this. You recently talked about this at uh, Enterprise Connect. So do you want to take us through kind of a, a plotted history of kind of where we've come from and where we are today? Yeah, no, absolutely. That sounds like a great starting point, Rob. So, I mean, first and foremost, I, I don't think that there's a formal definition of an AI assistant. Um, it, in general, it's the idea that you have artificial intelligence and that it is helpful and specifically that it helps you um, get to, you know, end of a specific job, right? So um, I'm going to come right out and say today, I mean, my assessment is that anything almost that's labeled as an AI assistant is more aspirational because I think while, you know, we see moments of brilliance from, you know, these AI assistants or AI companions or co-pilots or whatever, you know, the vendors choose to call them. The truth of the matter is um, probably, you know, if you had a grade six son or daughter on a regular basis, they might, you know, serve as a better assistant because, you know, the assistants now, they don't really have a memory from day to day. So if you hired somebody and if, you know, today they forgot everything you told them yesterday, that would be problematic. And there's a lot of common sense things that um, these AI assistants, you know, don't do. But if we look for a quick history, because this has been around the idea of having artificial intelligence, you know, help us um, get our, you know, work done has been around for a long time. So um, a quick history, um, you know, back in 1966, so that's like forever ago. That's actually the year I was born. Before, um, I, before I was born. <laughs> I know, I know, because I'm older and, and maybe wiser. But, you know, somebody created this, uh, this, assi this assistant or, you know, called Eliza, which simulated a talking with a psychotherapist. Now, it didn't use any of the fancy generative AI. It just used kind of some simple things. And, you know, how does that make you feel after whatever you said? Um, you know, by 1972, there was a new version called Perry that was slightly, you know, more intelligent. And then if you remember, you know, in uh, Office 2000 to 2003, Microsoft introduced this, these assistants. Uh, it was technically the paperclip one. You could choose different one was called Clip It, but everybody still and then referred to it as Clippy. It's generated lots of memes. And, and um, well, yeah. <laughs> And then I was looking and this surprised me, you know, um, Apple came out with Siri, um, in 2011. So it's been, it's been quite a while. A uh, Google then immediately Google now was 2012. Um, and then Cortana in 2014. Uh, and then really, you know, I would say also in 2014, which still is around to today. And I have some in my house, which is the, uh, the Amazon Echo and Alexa. I'm always hesitant to say that because I have one near me and I have to make sure that I've turned it off so it's not. Yeah, listening. and you'll probably activate mine as well if you start oh, the, saying the uh, the invoke. Uh, there you so. go. So, so you know, those are you know kind of the the assistants, and then of course with Chat GPT, you know, now the generative AI assistants are all the rage, right? So that's where we are today. But I mean. A long and storied history all the way from 1966 to today. But we have come a long way, haven't we, Kevin? And the, the kind of natural language processing element of, of these uh, platforms is unbelievable nowadays. It's unbelievably accurate. And, you know, we're, we're using things for, you know, across the enterprise now, aren't we? Lots and lots of use cases. But in our home lives, you know, home devices, playing, you know, playing music, setting timers for, you know, when you're boiling eggs and, and cooking and whatever else. It's, it, you know, we have come such a long way. The technology is, as you say, with generative AI, really feels like um, it's become 
a very practical uh, solution to a lot of problems or or things that we you know historically have taken time to do. So, I mean, in terms of um, the enterprise, right? We are, we're seeing this across UC. We're seeing this across CX. Um, we're seeing it, I suppose, throughout workflow automation in organizations and productivity tools. And I suppose we could even see it in a kind of IoT environment now where we can turn lights on automatically with AI assistants and voice controlled AI assistants. Right. I mean, how, when, when I think about the kind of the big one, Microsoft Copilot, which is, yes. as we know, kind of powered by ChatGPT, I mean, do we see Copilot? I mean, I see that as like an AI assistant. Will it become an AI voice assistant at some point? I know we have Cortana, um, but, you know, I'm just kind of wondering where does, you know, where these products are going to end up in the enterprise. Is there going to be one, you know, one tool to rule them all, all or is there going to be, you know, a whole host of assistants within the enterprise, within the workplace? Yeah. So, okay. So you asked a, a couple of really good, I think, questions. So, you know, unlike, you know, with the home things, when you're play a song, set a timer, turn on my lights, the idea of an assistant is probably a multi-step process, you know, um, being able to have some agency, uh, either being triggered by certain things. Um, and that's really where, you know, the challenge is, um, and where the evolution and why I say that, you know, most of the things that are called assistants today um, don't really have that agency. So it's that's more of an aspirational title in terms of the input mechanism. I, th I think we're seeing, you know, it's interesting for a while, you know, voice, nobody would call or voice, you know, everything was chat and text. I think with um, AI as an assistant, you know, voice has both an input and an output mechanism, depending where you are. Um, if you're in a car or you're, you know, you're, you're in a manufacturing operation where you need to use your hands. Um, this is coming back. And, and quite frankly, it seems more humanistic to be able to, to chat with these. I think mm -hmm. uh, one of the other episodes we talked about character.ai, which allows you to put a voice and use that voice input and output. The challenge, really, whether the input is text or the input is voice and the output being voice, the challenge still right now is just the intelligence part of the assistant at the core um, and its ability to carry out like multi-step tasks. That's still where there's a lot of work going on. And some of the news stories I think we're going to highlight are, are looking at that as well. But I think like the Star Trek computer you know, voice and just asking, you know, um, is going to become, you know, one of the primary mechanisms. And certainly you see that with Siri. You do, you know, on Copilot, on Copilot Mobile, you can use voice to to interact if you choose. Yeah, so it's 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 good. It's exciting, isn't it, where we are now with generative AI. And when we plug voice into yes. AI or AI into voice, it's, it feels like almost voice is getting a revival in in a, in a way. But um, I, we, we, I'm especially interested to see where this is heading in terms of like getting that human like understanding and empathy. And you know, are we ever going to really be able to have that real life? Can I say real life conversation with an AI? And it could eventually, I suppose, even be a humanoid robot in our house, going it walking around doing the cooking and the ironing and, and things like that. So it, um, it is interesting. I mean, how far do you think we are away from actually getting to that point where we can have r seamless conversation with AI? Well, I, I think in certain contexts, you can already do that. And so, um, you know, and I think that the voice part, the, the, the most important piece of the voice part is just that it does exactly what you were talking about. It creates that human empathy. And so certainly if, for example, you wanted to create a therapy type of a, a assistant, you know, having that voice um, input and output actually does create that 
emotional connection, even though there's not, you know, a human on the other side. But, you know, I think that there are certain, you know, there are very helpful use cases where th that may be, you know, um, a very good thing to do. I, the, the challenge in the enterprise space is just all the moving pieces that you need the assistant to be able to deal with and in, you know, all the different applications, all the different data sources. Um, and today, and, you know, we talked about, and one of the AI minutes previously was about, you know, grounding, which is the context. And for the most part, you know, if we say the AI assistant is doing meeting summaries, um, it's only based on the transcript of the meeting. And so simple things that you would expect anybody to know. So if I, you know, in a meeting summary, if it says uh, the meet, you know, we're going to do this by next Friday. And if I ask, you know, the AI assistant, what's the data next Friday? It has no ability to do that mm -hmm. because today it doesn't have that grounding, that, that, you know, context. And so clearly that's something that any reasonable assistant could use a calendar and answer that question for you. So I think that in the enterprise setting, because there's so many different things that we expect you know, humans and, you know, an assistant to be able to reason over. Um, we've got a lot of piece parts, but nobody has put them all together yet. Yeah. It feels like almost like we've been here before in the past when we had all these disparate video, <laughs> video conferencing platforms and none of them actually integrated very well, but you know, they all did their job very well. And ultimately we're going to come full circle with AI, doesn't it? It feels like, you know, these platforms, you're not just going to have one assistant that's just going to do everything. You're going to have lots of AI assistants in different places doing different things. And But are they going to talk together? I think that's going to be the, the ongoing challenge. And, I uh, think you're 100% you're right. I, I, um, I finished writing an article, it's not posted yet, that talked about it, it used the exact analogy of it. It really took decades for video conferencing vendors, you know, customers for decades wanted interoperability. And arguably today we have pretty good interoperability, but that took decades. And so, you know, I think we're going to go through this period of time where it's like, okay, I've got a different AI assistant, whether I have one on my phone and one on my desktop applications and one of my home devices and I don't think the vendors in the short term are going to be compelled to have the assistants work well together. So um, I think that that's an interesting thing. What happens when one assistant has one idea and another assistant has another? Um, I think over the next several years, we're going to we're going to figure figure that out because we're going to live through those difficult interactions. Absolutely. Well, moving on. Let's talk about some AI news that we've caught, uh, yes. that we that we curated from from the world uh, recently. And um, tech, the, the first article I wanted to kind of dig into, Kevin, is uh, was on Tech Radar actually, and it was uh, around uh, Moshi uh, AI's new voice assistant, and apparently it's outpacing OpenAI's ChatGPT. I'm not sure about that, but it uh, it claims to. Um, be almost kind of a breakthrough in AI voice technology. Um, now, I know you've clicked onto the website and you've had a good look at this. Um, take us through this story, this, this Moshi AI voice assistant, and what do you think? Yeah, so I think that this is a great example of how there's, you know, groups throughout the world, this group happened to be based in France, um, that are doing phenomenal things. And I, I think... Yes, to, you know, it is outpacing chat GPT and the chat GPT 4.0 model in specific areas, um, but not necessarily overall. So there's still a lot of great research in piece parts. This team, which was eight developers and over six months created this Moshi chat, uh, had the opportunity to try it. It does some really interesting things. So first of all, it's open source, which is phenomenal. Um, because, you know, then other people, other smart groups of people, whether they're eight or 80 or 800, can build on what they've done. Um, and, and the interesting thing here is like humans, you know, while you're talking, I can be both listening, thinking, and then sometimes interrupting you. <laughs> um, and, and so, you know, Mashi has the ability to both talk and listen at the same time. So it's bio-directional. So you can kind of interrupt it more. Um, and supposedly it thinks 
while it's listening. I mean, all that being said, the latency is very low, so it feels more like a conversation with a human. Now, I go check it out. Um, it it is you know also is designed to be able to run locally, so that you know there is some privacy and some ability. Apple intelligence talks about that. You know, if the data go, doesn't go to the cloud, it's more secure, what have you. Um, the demos, you know, there's some great demos and there's some also funny demos because it does get into kind of this this loop sometimes where th th there was one where it just started saying, I'm sorry. And then you say, you know, you don't need to say you're sorry. And then it apologizes again for saying it's sorry. And, um, and you know, as well, one of the things that they claim is it can talk in a lot of different accents because uh, they trained, you know, um, a much more elaborate uh, text-to-speech model, yeah. and so up it's to quite seventy positive. different, up to seventy different emotional um, and speaking styles, apparently claims. So, but it it does sound, you know, it's got definitely got that silly edge to it as well, hasn't it? It's, it's like an AI with a sense of humor. So, uh, definitely one to look out for. Whether it's one for the workplace, I'm not sure. What do you think? Well, I think that they, so the technology, I think that, you know, whether it's uh, Zoom, Cisco, <laughs> WebEx, Microsoft, Ring Central's, like somebody will probably acquire the technology because, you know, this team had a lot of great ideas yep. um, and it certainly does. It's very responsive. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's one to look out for. So it's moshi.chat. Jump on the website, have a look. Uh, uh, it's definitely worth uh, five minutes of your time. Yeah, it's fun. It, it, it'll, it'll make you laugh, maybe. <laughs> Next up, um, we got a story about uh, a company called Dust securing an additional $16 million for its enterprise AI assistants that essentially kind of integrate with internal data, don't they? Which is, is something, you know, the holy grail for a lot of organizations, not just kind of using ChatGPT externally, but actually integrating it with the data that, that they've actually got on their own, uh, their first party data. So what do you think to this story, Kevin? Yeah, so I think that this is a very interesting, um, you know, company. I guess they raised like 16, an additional $16 million. Um, you know, this comes back to when we talked about grounding and, you know, um, retrieval augmented generation or RAG. Um, context is everything for these generative AI models. So the example I gave about, well, what's the date of next Friday? Like that's about context. And so, you know, th companies like Dust, and there's lots of them, they're saying like, okay, you got this, this pre-trained, you know, this generative pre-trained transformer model that is great at summarizing, great at building and understanding English sentences. But if it doesn't know about anything about your organization, it's just very generalized. And so how do you connect that in? And that context, that grounding, um, I think is, is key. Um, now the interesting thing is, I think there's so much AI news and so much AI capabilities out there, like, I think people um, don't understand, for example, with Microsoft and their Copilot Studio, that's one of the key things that Copilot Studio allows you to do is create your own Copilots that through graph connectors and other mechanisms are connected into your corporate data. So exactly what Dust is trying to do, that capability exists in Copilot Studio now, Microsoft hasn't done themselves any favors because they've called everything Copilot. So I feel like people have Copilot overload. And I think that there's very few, you know, IT pros and organizations that have even experimented with Copilot Studio or some of the other grounding tools such as Dust. So I think what Dust is doing is tremendously important. If we don't have contextual grounding, you know, we don't have an AI assistant. And so, you know, tools from some more, you know, we, we need to figure that out. So generative AI plus that context um, is what's really going to, you know, move us from aspirational to real AI assistance. Yeah. And, and it goes back to what we just talked about around interoperability and integrations. Just we, we've got to get these platforms talking together, but not just externally in, in the kind of world of SaaS, but I suppose internally with our databases and, and all that kind of thing. I suppose, and, and, and it is not 
easy. It's not not an easy thing, is it? Just to take on uh, a data engineering task nowadays, you know, and plug AI in. You know, it's uh, it requires. No, I think the vendors, skills. you know, whether they're CX vendors or you know, not you know, just like uh, tools targeted to just knowledge workers. I think you know, there's a lot of demos that make it look easy, but I think that there's some significant challenges uh, with that. Now, and this is a perfect time, Rob, to talk about today's AI minute because it really ties into perhaps some of the, the challenges around getting this better um, context. And so for today, um, the AI minute is uh, orchestration. And so uh, orchestration, it's kind of, you see this uh, orchestra over there. So it has... It really has to do with the coordination and management of various components towards the achievement of a goal. So just like, you know, this conductor uh, in an orchestra, you may have all these piece parts, all these, you know, uh, musicians that are phenomenal on their own. But if they're not synchronized, that AI orchestration, you're not going to get good results. And so I took an example here, um, and this happens to be, uh, a diagram that applies to Microsoft Copilot, but, but it is similar for any, any AI that seeks to be an AI assistant. Because what that means is if you look over here and you can replace the Microsoft cloud with any other cloud, but you have these foundational models. These are these pre-trained models. So chat GPT or Claude or, you know, the various other models. You have ideally your data to give a context. Um, and so now here's the thing is you may have multiple other sources and other skills. And so the AI orchestration, when you ask a question, it has to be able to decide, well, what source am I going to go to? Am I going to go to the Internet? Am I going to go to an internal database? Am I going to go to documents and SharePoint? And what happens if the documents disagree? You know, when you look up technical information, uh, a lot of times you find multiple versions of the same document. And as a, you know, a human assistant, we say, well, wait a second, this one has, you know, a later date. And so therefore it's more accurate. Well, with AI orchestration, it has to find all the different data sources and then be able to decide what's, you know, relevant. What's, was this just a sarcastic piece? And I'm going to ignore that. Um, bring that all together. And also be able to deal with, you know, tasks that take time to execute. Maybe you have to, maybe it takes a, a day to go and send out a query because you want a quote on something. Um, so anyway, or, orchestration becomes key to delivering really on this, this goal of having a true AI assistant. And so that is today's AI minute. Well, thanks for that, Kevin. I mean, orchestration does evoke an image of a, uh, a very, I suppose, well-coordinated symphony. But uh, as we know, in AI and uh, the world of generative AI, it's not always perfect, is it? But um, uh, we will uh, we will hope for perfect orchestration going forward. But um, lots of complexity. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Kevin, uh, great to see you again. Uh, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today, um, but it's been great talking to you about AI assistants, AI voice assistants, and some of the uh, you know latest news surrounding this topic. But uh, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, well, thanks, Rob. And as always, we'll have links below here, and you know, so to some of the articles that we reference, and uh, go take a look because uh, there's a lot of fascinating details in this wonderful and. Uh, exciting times for AI assistance. Absolutely. And thanks to everyone for ch uh, watching our AI show. If you've got some good takeaways from today's session, do give us a quick like on the social or mention. It's always appreciated. And you can uh, check out our links uh, on f uh, for Kevin and myself on, on LinkedIn, especially uh, in the description below. I'm Rob Scott from UC Today. Thanks for watching. <laughs>